How you doing this evening? Welcome in. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm excited to get in, man. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. No doubt about it. Okay, so first of all, you have the Gavin Lux injury, and then you have the Miguel Rojas situation to where he's just absolutely just tattooing the ball right now. Of course, it's only spring training, and it's early, but, you know, a lot of good early signs. And then Noah Syndergaard has pitched very well. His velo is not exactly where he wants it to be, but Dustin May looked good in his last outing. Ryan Pepio, his slider looks fantastic. He reshaped it in the sense that he can he can make it a little bit smaller to make it cutterish looking to keep it in the zone a little bit better so he can access the zone better where he can make it bigger, give it depth, give some curveball. Michael Grove reshaped his fastball as well. So things are looking up. So initial thoughts on spring training to anybody in the audience and to you, Chase. Man, it's been a lot of fun to watch. Um, I, it sucks to see Gavin Lux go down, man, and to, to listen to you know his interview post-injury and things like that where he's – crying and emotional it's it's tough to see um you know because going into the season you you're i mean i think in every dodger dodger <clears throat> fan's mind you know that's that's your everyday shortstop um and to see him go down i mean simply just run into a base it sucks um you know that supposedly the surgery went well i mm -hmm. did see that there was uh they found out it was a little bit more there's a little bit more damage to the lcl uh, when they thought and they thought it was just uh they thought it was just sprained um but man to see him emotional like that sucked um mm -hmm. but to see the performance of guys like you know jason hayward uh noah Syndergaard, um dustin man looks really really good um there's a lot of a lot of good things to to look at man and rojas like you said he's, he's lighting it up offensively um and, and i don't think that there should be any concern on anybody you know or from anybody um in regards to his defense, because uh, a guy can play defense, man. Um, so I'm excited to, to you know, can continue to keep up with it and, um, man, just see how it plays out. And James Altman. James Altman has <laughs> absolutely taken the opportunities he, he gave last year. Of course, he struck out some, but he took the opportunities he got last year and took off with them. And he's doing it again here in this spring training. And I know some people think he's not going to make the opening day roster. If it continues like this and he continues to take advantage of his opportunities like he has and he doesn't make the opening day roster, there's something wrong. Yeah, man, absolutely. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit later, you know, but we're going to, uh, spoiler alert, we're going to talk about, you know, who we think should be the starting outfield on opening day. Um, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll just be honest with you, he's in my, he's in my top three right now. Mm -hmm. So, I yep. mean, just just by his performance, man, he's... Mookie, James, and Jason would be my yes. guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's it. Yeah, I think most Dodgers feel that way, so continue on, yeah. Yeah, man, I, you know, I I don't also, I like to, you know, I like to look at guys when we're talking, I guess we can go ahead and talk about the outfield. Um, I don't mind Chris Taylor in the outfield. Uh, I don't mind Trace Thompson in the outfield. Sure. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, there, there's five good outfielders right there that, that we just named within the last couple seconds. Um, you know, but the to see the improvement, I guess you could say, from Jason Hayward um, coming into spring training, you know, with the, the injury last season, everybody's not know. Mm -hmm. They weren't sure, you know, how he was going to come in and perform. Um, I think he's done a fantastic job. Um, I saw an interview not too long ago with, uh, Freddie Freeman, he was talking about Jason Hayward and how they've, yeah. you know, been buddies for a long time. And, um, you know, he's he's seen the best of Jason Hayward, um, and he knows mm -hmm. that there's a lot in there. He said that, you know, he came in with a little bit of a chip on his shoulder to, to kind of prove everybody wrong um, after he had kind of a down year last year. Um, and just some of the improvements he's made with his swing, man, I think that, you know, if he's not playing the outfield, I think he has a chance to be the DH. Yeah, J.D. Martinez – Mike says, early on it is spring training, but early on not impressed with Martinez, Peralta, and Taylor. Hope they can step it up offensively in the regular season. And I'm sure they will. You know, those are proven veterans. We've talked about several different times that the Dodgers like to go out and get veterans. And, you know, I think I think you need to have a, you know, I, I think the Dodgers would rather have like a 33, 34, 35-year-old who has a track record over a rookie but like we said, if James Altman continues to perform the way he is, and also Andy Pajes, I don't know if you've seen him in spring training, he lost 25 pounds, and he looks looks absolutely fantastic. He looks like a guy to me that might get major league playing time this year. He's on that kind of mission. 
and Johnny DeLuca. Johnny DeLuca is a guy who has every single tool. He has the speed. He has the power. He's a guy that, in my opinion, year in and year out consistently has the ability to be a 2020 guy and on the right year could be a 30-30 guy. So add those two guys in the mix. Then you guys, <laughs> then you got guys like Bradley Zimmer, Steven Duggar, and, and guys like that. And so, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a completely crowded outfield, and it's one that there is a lot of competition. You're breaking away now for the, the World Baseball Classic. So this last couple weeks, three weeks or however long it is of spring training, it's going to continue to be fascinating. Yeah, man, absolutely. And, you know, good for us being in Oklahoma, man. We're going to see a lot of good baseball. We're going to see a lot of good mm-hmm. outfielders um, here in Oklahoma City. Um, you know, I, I I was looking at some some pictures and some video, you know, of Andy Pajes coming into, into spring training, man. He went from looking like a linebacker to looking like a mm-hmm. DB. Um, yeah. He looks really, really good. I think you're going to see – a big time improvement in his speed. Um, yeah. I'm, I don't think that he's going to lose any any of his his arm talent. I don't think that he's going to lose any of his power. Um, just with his swing and the way that he generates things, um, I don't I don't think you're going to see a lot of decline in that. I yeah. think that he, he's really just slimmed up and uh, you know really cut. Um, he he looks good. I would totally agree with that, and it just looks to me like because he's lost that 25 pounds. He doesn't have to create that tilt quite as much to get the ball in the air. I think, I think he can access, you know, the, the air as far as hitting fly balls a little differently. Being down 25 pounds, so yeah, he looks absolutely fantastic. Hey, I forgot to mention our prospect feature tonight is on one of the up and coming, fastest rising right-handed pitchers in the game, Nick Frasso. So very excited to talk about him. I know you're big into pitching, Chase, and so that's going to be fun talking about him. Austin Brubaker, Gavin's injury has put a damper on what has been a fun spring so far. Lots of good signs and plenty of opportunities for the younger guys to grow. Really glad baseball is back. And hey, good evening, Austin Brubaker, and congratulations for being in Cooperstown, New York. How about that? Checking in from Cooperstown, Austin is. Man, I'm jealous. I'm stuck here in, you know, Oklahoma City. Uh, luckily, the weather. The weather's pretty nice right now. Uh, I can't complain about it too much. Um, But, man, Cooperstown would be a fun place to be right now, that's for sure. I just got my son off to London yesterday. So he was in New York City probably about noon yesterday, then flew the eight hours over to London to see his girlfriend, so got him off. Hey, let's get back to Miguel Rojas. And, again, the Dodgers went and got him. We've talked about it a couple different occasions for insurance, for whatever infield position they needed insurance for. And, Turned out they're going to need it faster than they thought because of the Gavin Lux injury. You'd have to assume, and, and Dave Roberts has said Miguel Rojas is going to be, you know, the bulk starter at shortstop. And you know, there's kind of this perception because he's been so good defensively that, and and last year he did struggle. I mean, last year he hit what did he hit two thirty something? So, huh, yeah. So last year was not good offensively for him, but he is a two sixty career hitter. It's not like he's been a bad offensive player. You know, so he hit 265 in 2021. He hit 304 in 2020, and his his career OPS is 672, which, you know, 672 OPS is not elite by any category, any shape or form. But, Chase, what excites me about him is his on-base percentage is 314, and he has really good bat-to-ball skills, and we talk about all the time how the Dodgers just kind of need that guy that might hit that ground ball up the middle and just put the ball in play from time to time. And he seems like a guy that can do that. Now, these numbers were from a couple of years ago, and and I know he's a little bit older now. He's 35 years old. But, you know, he's also going to be in a better offense. He's going to have better offensive players around him, so he's going to get better pitching to hit. So I think Miguel Rojas has a chance to, you know, all the Dodgers really need out of him is 250, 260, hit five or six home runs, have a 300 on base percentage, you know, put the ball in play, don't strike out a whole lot. I don't think he struck out yet this spring. So I'm excited about Miguel Rojas. Man, I am too. And, and I like how you mentioned, you know, that he's surrounded by offensive firepower. Um, yeah. So ne- I don't, I'm not necessarily worried about his offense, to be honest with you. And I think that, you know, going back to your point with him being surrounded by, you know, those big names with the big bats. He's going to see better mm-hmm. pitching because, you know, in my mind, if I'm pitching, I'd much rather throw to him than I would to Freddie. I'd much rather throw to him than I would to Mookie. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm going to attack him 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and try to give him just my best pitches, you know, and, and just say, if you beat me, you beat me. Um, because I know that, you know, more than likely I'm going to get beat by one of those other guys here pretty soon. Um, just because of how talented they are. So I and think if you do, you can, don't need another guy on base. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. I think that he's going to he's gonna be that role guy, you know, like you mm-hmm. said, that just he gets his base hits and, you know, he's he, he gets on base, you know, which which sets up RBI opportunities. It sets up multi, multi, uh, uh, multi-run home runs. It, it sets mm-hmm. up a whole lot. And the leadership, man, he is already a leader on this team. I mean, it it is real. And, you know, you talk about Miguel Vargas, who's not swinging the bat yet, but I don't know if you saw the defense he played the other day. He went to right field, made a nice catch, and then he he made a couple of nice plays on ground balls. And I really think, you know, getting to play next to Miguel Rojas, we've talked about this several times, but, but you know, I, I'm just as equally as excited about that role for Rojas helping Miguel Vargas as I am anything else. Yeah, we talked about the mentorship part when when the trade first went through. I think we were um, we were a little surprised, but it's almost like the Dodgers knew that something was going to happen, whether yeah. that was to Lux or to another infielder. <laughs> yeah. um, and as unfortunate as it is, I'm I'm really glad that we have a guy, you know, like Rojas who who's experienced and and mm-hmm. who's proven to be a very very elite defender. Um, you know, and, and again, offensively, we'll see what happens. I'm not not super concerned Coming off Tommy Johnson. the other bats that you have in the lineup. So I think, I mean, I think that they're in really, really good shape. Did you see Dustin May's last performance, man? I, I tell you what, Dustin May, of course, he's coming off the Tommy John. So, you know, the, the thing about Tommy John is there's not probably going to be any pain to it. But what I hear from these guys, you know, time and time again, that have come off the Tommy John, which is almost every single pitching prospect in the Dodgers organization is it doesn't hurt nothing like that. It just doesn't feel the same, so your command's not the same. You, you, you know, you're not re- you're not feeling it the way you normally would, so it doesn't feel like you're hitting your spots like you normally do. Okay, but having said that, watching Dustin May the other day it just brought back that, you know, in my opinion, Dustin May has the absolute best raw stuff of any pitcher in the Dodgers organization, and that's saying a lot because you know you have the Bobby Millers and now the the Noah Syndergaards and the Walker Buehlers and all these guys. The Nick Frassos, the Nick Nestrinis, Kyle Hurts, and these guys, Emmett Sheehan's. I think Dustin May has the best raw stuff. You know, when you look at the way his ball explodes, that last five feet. You know, you've been at, you've been at, in, in in high in big time situations, and that you know, there's some guys that just it seems like that last five feet that ball explodes. You know what I mean to the yeah, catcher? Absolutely. And then it has late movement to move off the barrel, and then as long as he is, he gets that great extension. So. His 98 looks like about 104 to the hitter for an effective velocity. And then he has just goofy of enough of kind of a, a, a you know, an arm whip to his release that it's just uncomfortable for hitters. So it's just, Dustin May's insane to me. Yeah, man, and I'm not much to talk about spin rate. I'm not talking, I mean, sure. stuff like that. You know, I'm, I'm not a really big numbers guy. I know that stuff's important and I know it, it, it kind of tells the tale, if you will. Um, but man, with like you said, that last five feet, it looks like it really jumps, um, and and it has a lot to do with how much spin he puts on the ball. Um, in terms of his off-speed pitches, man, his off-speed is gross, yes. and there's no other way to put it. And it's just because it has such late break, mm-hmm. which makes it so difficult for a hitter, man. It makes it so hard. Um, you know, when, humans when aren't supposed to throw 98 mile an hour sinkers that look like frisbees they're not supposed to be able to do that <laughs> that's it's it's not natural um he, it's a it's a freakishly weird thing and uh man with with the way the game's going now it seems like it's it's becoming more and more common to see guys that are able to run it up to 95 97 mm-hmm. whatever but he's able to do that with a sinking fastball mm-hmm. which is which is beyond me because if you look at how much that sucker breaks and then put it into perspective, you know, this thing's breaking a ton. It is. Um, so when it's coming in at 98 plus the break, how do you hit it? You yeah. just close your eyes and whisper the I best. don't know, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck is my, you know, I mean, one of those deals where, you know, the guy on deck goes, hey, what's he got? And he goes, Hell if I know. All I know is if you see those three pitches, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> He's one of those guys. Hey, good evening, Tamale. We're so glad that you finally caught one of these shows live, and we're going to break down Nick Frasso in our in our prospect feature segment. But 
We're talking a little bit about spring training first. Hey, did you get a chance to see Gavin Stone's one inning the other day? How about that changeup? Holy man! Cow. <laughs> it, I love, I love his changeup. It's, it's, oh, it's some, it's incredible. It really it is. is. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's his best pitch. It's his plus plus. Um, I think that, um, you know, and I, I'll, I'll say this time and again: a good changeup is the hardest pitch to hit in baseball. Mm-hmm. Everything looks like a fastball until you get the late dive, until you mm-hmm. get the late uh, late run. Um, and with what he's able to do with that, it, it's it's insane. Mm-hmm. It's it's impressive. Um, he's going to make a lot of money off that pitch. No doubt. Okay, so Michael Grove, I'm glad Mike brought this up. He looked good the other day, and he did. I had a chance to talk to him. You know, a lot of these Dodgers made offseason adjustments. We're going to talk about some that Pepio made, Michael Grove made. It seemed like a lot of them made – similar adjustments with their slider good evening valerie thank you very much for your your kind words there calling us a dynamic duo we we love it when you join this is fantastic we love the interaction we have such a wonderful community here to talk dodgers baseball which we love let's talk michael grove adjustments specifically though chase he's always had the big curveball right and then he's always had a, a good fastball that has good good you know good ride to it and he's very athletic if you've ever seen him play football he was a running back, and he was just extremely athletic, a great athlete. His motion is extremely athletic. I have an article that kind of just shows exactly how athletic he is. Okay, so what he did last year, last uh, Chase, was that he would get the two strikes really well. You know, he'd, he'd ride the top of the zone the fastball, he'd dump in a curveball, and it'd be like 0-2-1-2. Oh, two, two. Okay, well, then he didn't have a put-away pitch. So what he's done this year is he added a, a slider, you know, the, and he's and he's kind of has a couple different depths to it to have put away pitches for right handers. So I think he's probably going to try to put away lefties with that curveball and then dump the slider into lefties for the strike and then dump the curveball into righties for a strike and then try to put them away with two strikes with the slider. So coming into this year in the offseason, I should say, his number one focus was I have got to figure out a put away pitch with two strikes. He feels like that slider will do it for him. Yeah, and it, man, a, a, a slider is it's impressive because not only does it change in depth, but it changes yes. from side to side, yeah. um, which is the biggest difference, you know, between a curveball and a slider. I personally, this is it all comes down to personal opinion. I'm more <laughs> yeah, of a fan of the right. slider just because you have you have the depth and you have the side to side movement. Yes. Um, on a good slider, on a bad slider, when it's moving side to side, it's not very effective. Um, in my opinion, that's a cutter nowadays. They, they call yeah. that a cutter nowadays, by the way. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and and I think that not only are you going to see him try to put guys away right handers with that slider, but I also think you're going to see a lot of back foot sliders for the for the left handers, mm-hmm. um, the ones that just yeah. kind of drop off the table, especially after they've seen the twelve six. Um, you know, it's it's really loopy, it's really bendy. Um, you know, and coming out of the hand, I'm sure it's going to look pretty similar. Um, but it's going to come in about, oh man, I'd say four or five miles an hour faster. Yep. Um, and it's going to be completely different in terms of where it ends up. Um, so I think that you're going to see a lot of back uh, back foot stuff too. Yeah, Kyle Hurt threw a 91 mile hour slider earlier this year. I I could, I mean, I was like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, <laughs> a 91 mile hour slider. Austin Brubaker says, holy cow, had has Gavin looked. Has Gavin looked great the past two outings? Yes, absolutely he has. His stuff is absolutely wicked. I know Austin's had a chance to sit behind him like you and I both have. Until you actually get to see Gavin Stone in person from be- directly behind him and see just how his ball just moves, it's it, you really don't quite understand exactly how good Gavin Stone is. So, yes, his stuff is wicked, and Austin loved the way he mixed his pitches and used the pitch clock to his advantage. That's a good point, too, you know, because – the pitch clock, and I talked to Landon Knack about this. I asked him what he thought. He said, you know what, I didn't have a violation. It was 18 seconds at AA last year. He didn't have a problem with it. He liked it. He thought moving it to 20 seconds was going to make all the difference in the world. So he likes the pitch clock. But one thing that, that pitchers have realized they can do is, hey, yeah, you got to start getting set. But then once you get set and come set, then you can hold it as long as you want. There's no pitch clock at that point. So they're using that as a timing advantage. Right, absolutely, and and something that we have really harped on our guys. I'll I'll go back to you know I'm coaching in high school, and one thing that we really harp on is mixing up timing, yeah. um, and that's not just with coming set. You know, we we have different calls for different things, 
um, you know, going from a two second hold to an eight second hold to a yeah. to a six second hold, um, it throws off the timing of the runner, mm-hmm. and it really makes the batter mad, which is which is lovely um, as yeah. a, as a pitcher. Um, to me, I think if I were to if I were to pitch with a pitch clock, I I'd like it simply because I'm a tempo guy, um, and yeah. once I find my rhythm, I'm just give me the ball, give me the give me the call, and and let's go. Um, and I think it's going to be easier for guys to find rhythm once they once they adjust to it. Mm-hmm. Um, at least for myself, I, I would have had no issue with it just because I'm you know catch the ball, get the sign, and and make the pitch. Um, but yeah, I, I I mean I know a lot of a lot of people don't like the don't like the pitch clock. So if you've ever been to a college baseball game and watched a college pitching coach call pitches, and a game lasts three and a half four hours because of this college pitching coach going through seventeen signals with runners on base, you realize that a pitch clock is needed. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and that, and that's know. why I love you know we're we're Oklahoma State guys. Um, yeah. Vanderbilt kind of started. Or it was yes Vanderbilt. they did. Tennessee, um, the little the little wristwatch mm-hmm. thing, you know, they just check the wristwatch, you know, hey, we're throwing a curveball away, um, get the call, and they and they go and do it, and I I think that that's that definitely helps in terms of you know when there's a pitch clock because when you're given signs, you know, there's guys that are in the opposing dugout that are, I mean, their job is to pick your signs to try to mm-hmm. figure out what you're doing, and and with this little band, I I think that's near impossible. Hey, thoughts on Noah Syndergaard? I thought he looked pretty good the other day. You know, reports are, of course, I don't get StatCast data with these broadcasts, and I try to look it up. I haven't been able to find it. So reports are Velo is down. But to me, it looked like he was commanding the top of the zone well. He had depth to his slider. He was commanding the the glove side part of the zone very well, which is a big aspect of his pitching. So what do you think of Noah Syndergaard? Man, I was really impressed with him, especially you know coming off the Tommy John surgery. You, uh, you hit the nail on the head when you say that guys just don't feel the same. Um, there's there's not a lot of the same feel. You can't seem to to figure out what your mechanics used to be. They can't. Right. Nothing seems right. Nothing seems comfortable. Um, and for him to just come in and pound the zone, sure the velo may be down a little bit, um, but he, I mean, he was extremely effective. Um, he hadn't given up a run yet. Um, you know, and I think when that velo jumps back up, which it will, um, once he, mm-hmm. once he gets, you know, into into May, into June, um, you'll see that velo jump. And man, I I don't want to I want to knock on wood when I say this, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if if he's a Cy Young finalist. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Tomatly says Stone looks confident out there no doubt about it Gavin Stone is a very confident young man hey I know that I think Mike hit on it just a minute ago but worried about JD Martinez at all I know he worked with Miguel Vargas quite a bit in the offseason and you know he, he wants to be a Dodger he's reunited with Robert Van Scoyock but are you worried at all about JD Martinez you know coming into the coming into spring training I had kind of high expectations for him um, just because, you know, it seemed like every – I think he was the guy that I was talking about that every time he switched organizations, he seemed to find something, yeah. some kind of spark. And it hadn't seemed like that's happened yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and he had kind of a down year last year. He, his numbers have degressed over the past couple of years. So I am a little concerned. Um, and, and I'm not afraid to say that I could see, you know, if Jason Hayward's not starting in the outfield, I could see him taking that DH spot. What about Michael Bush? Uh, it's – That's my vote. Yeah, I know. I know it is. <laughs> you know oh. how I think about Michael, and I've seen him play many, many years. Right. And I, and yeah. I, know, I know all of his coaches that have coached him that know all this stuff. I've talked to him. That's my vote. <laughs> That's yeah, all no, I'll it, say about that. I don't. I don't blame if JD you one doesn't bit. handle it. Yeah. Yeah. I. I don't. I don't blame you one bit when you say that. Um, I just think that that with the way that Doc has done things, I think he's going to go with an older guy, mm-hmm. and, and rightfully so. I mean, I understand it. I get it. You know, yeah. guys that have shown shown to be really successful at the big league level. Um, man, I, I. It's. It's just hard. It, I mean, you know what I'm saying. It, he he's a young guy. Um, I I do without a doubt. I think he can do it. I just think that they're going to go a different direction because he's a rookie and they have some veterans on there that could fill that uh, that spot as well. Yep. 
Okay, Valerie wants to know uh, Andre Jackson. Okay, first of all, let me uh, address Andre Jackson. I'm so proud of this young man. I had a chance to talk to him at the end of 2021, and he is a little bit on that. You know, you remember he made his major league debut that year, and and he did well. And then he kind of got on that Mitch White train where he was just back and forth, back and forth. And by the end of 2021, I had a chance to talk to him. And he's like, you know what, my velo is like 91, 92. It's down a little bit. And then at the beginning of last year, 2022, man, he just was off. He struggled. He got put on the developmental list, went down, worked on a few things, and came back. And I have not talked to him about this. I never will. I don't like to pry in this scenario, these types of scenarios. I don't consider myself an investigative type news reporter. Does that make sense? I, I just, I, I don't like prying like that into guys' businesses. But I will say this. Andre Jackson found out the type of pitcher he is, in my opinion. You know, he I think he was chasing the velo. You know, hey, he wanted to be just like all the other guys that 96, 97 with the slider and the and the and the spin rate up in the zone. I think he realized, hey, I just need to throw my change up and I need to land my change up in the strike zone and then throw the fastball off of the change up. And I can be that type of pitcher. You know, I don't want to compare him to Greg Maddox, but that philosophy of a type of pitcher and I think he finally realized that's when he's at his best and since he's gone to that type of philosophy where he's basing his you know his his arsenal instead of basing his arsenal around velo and then and then getting the velo and then throwing the off speed off of that he's throwing the change up and then making his fastball look faster because the change up is landing so often I think yeah. that's really helped Andre Jackson and for that very fact, he's already on the 40-man. I think you're going to see him quite a bit with L.A., and I think he's going to be successful. I'm right there with you, man. And I think that there's been so much emphasis, especially in today's baseball, that has been put on velocity. Yes. Um, and, and you don't have to throw 97 miles an hour to be effective. In, in high school, it you helps. Have to, it helps. Right. <laughs> I'd right. like to throw 97, but <laughs> – right. In high school or in college, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be mid to upper nineties to be effective. You really don't. You know, if you, if you have good enough stuff, that's going to make you, that's going to make you talented. That's going to make you good. It's going to make you effective. If you can make your stuff move and you can yeah. throw everything for a strike, if I can throw it, if I can throw a two zero change up, and freeze you and get to two one, I've done my job. Yep. You know it. It, you can be effective with, with 90. You can be effective with 92, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Well, and the effective velocity. So, like, to time an inside fastball, right? Let's say you throw a fastball at 92. If it's on the inner half, you actually have to time it at 96 to be able to hit it. Does that make sense? Because you got to get the barrel out a little bit further out front of you to hit the ball, right? Well, that same 92 mile hour fastball in the outer half, you're actually timing 88. So, just by... Being able to locate your fastball on both sides of the plate, you're giving it different timings by about about eight miles an hour. So mm -hmm. guys that can locate both sides of the plate, they're able that that's called effective velocity. They're able to to create bad timing for hitters because of that. Andre's done a very good job of that. This is a great point from Tamatley. Bush is battling, having good at bats, but might be pressing. I will take the might out of that. I'll guarantee he is pressing. He is so competitive. Needs a nice double or home run. No doubt about that. Okay, we're about to run out of time here. We're gonna probably have to reconnect connect here in a minute because we want to get to this Frasso stuff. Okay, let me say this about Michael Bush. And, and uh, he's notoriously a slow starter. Always has been. And if you look at even 2021, his last three months of that season were unbelievable. So that was the one big concern I had was with, with Michael Bush was coming in trying to compete and battle for these spots. He never has been a fast starter, probably because he's from Minnesota and, you know, his whole whole entire life until about April or May, maybe even June, was in a cage. And so, you know, just naturally became a slow starter. I was worried about him starting slow. And I, I agree with Tamatli from that perspective. My point with him is I will promise you if you settle him in and say, hey, you're going to be the DH or the second baseman, for two months and we're going to get you you know 200 at bats no matter how you hit i promise you you'll see the right the real michael bush that's that's where i'm at with him but totally agree with there tamale 
Yeah, yeah, no, to bounce off of you. Real quick, we, we mentioned Ryan Pepio. I want to get into him real yep. just real fast. Um, with the adjustments that he made, you know, I was able to, uh, um, right before we hopped on here, I was able to go through some film uh, of him last year. That's my year. new dog, by the way. We got a new pit bull just the other day, so I apologize <laughs> for that. I can't stop it. Don't want to stop it, so there you go. <laughs> um, I, w- I, was, I was able to look at some film of him in 2022 mm-hmm. compared to his spring training film. And it, it, uh, it's different. The adjustments that he made, it, it looks mm-hmm. good. Um, the couple of things that I noticed is is he's really pulling himself through the zone, if you will. Um, he, he's pulling himself towards the catcher, and he's sca- he's staying skinny. Uh, before he was kind of he was kind of flying. His arm was kind of more of a mid to high three quarter, I'd mm-hmm. say. Um, he looks a lot more in line, if that makes sense. Yeah, does that well, make sense? What and I'm saying? he's done a lot of work to his body to allow him to access those movements and those positions. And so that's why you're seeing that. He looks he looks compact, if yep, you will. He does. He lo- it, it, it looks good. It looks really, yep, really good. Does. And and per- like, honestly, I prefer the 2023 Pepio yeah. uh, um, as compared to the 2022 in terms of mechanics. Yeah, well, and as far as let's get away from mechanics, because I'm not real good at pitching mechanics. You're way better at that than I am. We, you can return to that here in a minute. but. But as far as the mix goes, the, the two biggest things he did was, you know, he has this slider, and, and what he's done to it is just go watch the, his first couple performances. What he's done is to get ahead in the count, he's made his, his slider smaller, like a cutter. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And he's put, he puts less movement on it, just kind of as a get-me-over. And then whenever he has, like, two strikes on a hitter, he's made it bigger with depth for a swing-and-miss type of pitch. So... He's listed as a three-pitch mix right now, fastball, changeup, and slider, but he's really a five-pitch mix because he can make the slider smaller to get ahead in the count, just kind of as a, as a dump-me-in-there type of pitch to get ahead in the count, something that he struggled with last year. That's going to help him access the zone again. Then he can make it bigger, more like a curveball-type deal when he's ahead in the count. And then the second big adjustment he made was to his changeup, Last year, of course, it was wicked. We mentioned a couple of years ago how it, it's almost like a left-handed slider, and mm-hmm. he's done away with that. That It's not even fade, really. It's like break, you know, that that fade. He's done away with that and created just gone back to the tumble, which right. is going to allow him. You know, when you're both tumbling and fading a pitch, that's really hard to control, right? So yes. the only time, if you watch him now, the only time that he's really getting fade on that changeup it's when he's starting it to that glove side, like that Greg Maddox pitch, and hopping it back over the inside part of the plate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Otherwise, if he starts it down the middle, what he's doing last year, he started it down the middle of the plate, then it would fade and tumble out of the zone. Now he's starting it down the middle of the plate, and it's tumbling and staying on the plate. Mm-hmm. And that's going to allow him to access the strike zone a little bit better too. So I love the adjustments he made to his body, his mechanics, as you talked earlier, and I love the pitch mix adjustments he made as well. Yeah, man, I I, I think that he's really good, and he's he's got me excited. I think he has a good chance to uh, to make an impact um, in the big leagues. I really do. I think that he has a chance to make an impact um, for LA. Um, you know, and I'm I'm excited to see his role uh, moving forward. Valerie says I like Devin Mann more than trading for utility infielder. I wouldn't disagree with that at all. That's interesting because Pepio detractors tend to call him a two pitch guy destined to relieve five pitches more than enough for a starter. No doubt about it, Tamatly. You know, and again, he's listed as a three pitch guy, but he can just go watch it. I've got it on my Twitter. Just go watch it. His strike one pitches are cutters. And his strike two pitches for strikeouts are curveballs, and then he has that slider in between. So, okay, we are going to get to the Nick Frasso talk. Right now, we are not going to waste any more time. Here we go. All right, here is Nick Frasso. You got him, right, Chase? Yes. Okay, so Nick Frasso, first of all, he came over in the trade with Moises Brito. That sent Mitch White and Alex DeJesus. I loved Alex DeJesus. Shortstop, but I, I, you know, Tim Rogers and I always, we always projected him as a third baseman. I think that's where he would have ended up as a Dodger, but he came over to the Dodgers with Moises Brito for Mitch White and Alex DeJesus. So tell us what you see here. Uh, what I see is a tall, lanky, 
awkward looking son of a gun. Um, yeah. and I mean, that in the most, bat, yeah. <laughs> and I mean that in the most respectful way possible. Um, because it's guys like that that are extremely hard to hit due to how much, how far they get down the mound, his reach, his whip. Um, golly, uh, it, it reminds me, I don't, I don't even know what it reminds me of, to be honest with you. I, I was, I was on onto something and I lost it. Yeah. Um, he he just he's a tall goofy son of a gun, um, but the, I mean the way that he's able to if you, you saw that curveball not too long ago, he can break it off really really well. His fastball jumps on you extremely quick, and I I mean I'm guessing he's getting down to, you know release at, you know, fifty four feet. Um, if you consider how far down the mound he gets, uh, mm-hmm. he's taken away a lot, um, yep. and, and I'm sure that you, do you know what his what is his velo? His velo, he hit. I had him at 97 with my own eyes. I have heard that he's hit as high as 98, 99. If he's been that high, man, that that looks like about 106. And yep, that's, no doubt. That's not an exaggeration one bit. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's why guys are. That's why I mean, he's his stock has risen maybe more than any other pitching prospect of any of any organization anywhere. Yeah, and and. You know, I, like I said, I'm not much of a spin rate guy. I'm not much of a numbers guy, but I'm curious to see kind of what those are because I mean, it could. What'd you say, it, Chase? I'm sorry. I was reading. I was reading Austin's last comment. No, you're good. Um, I said I'm not much of a numbers guy, but in I would I wouldn't be curious to see what his spin rate is and and things like that because I say 106, but it, I mean, heck, it could be 108, 109, depending on how fast that thing is, how 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 quick he's get, getting it to rotate. Um. I don't know exact numbers, but I can tell you his spin rate is very good. Yeah, I mean he's he's really really impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you're gonna see. I, I hope we're able to hang on to him, man. I really do. Um, I think that he's going to be a very sought after guy. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about a trade scenario for yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the Dodgers have so many just unbelievably talented right-handers. I I could go on and on and on and on about the great pitchers that the Dodgers have. You know, from Nick Nestrini to Emmett Sheehan to the five rookies to this guy, Nick Frasso. And then you haven't even talked about the lefties like Alec Gamboa and Lyle Lockhart and John Rooney. And then the crop below them, you know, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I talked to Rob Hill, the director of minor league pitching for the Dodgers this last week. And he's like, man, it's insane how much talent, you know, he's, he's so pumped about that. But okay, Valerie, I love Fiducia, just worried about that he may be, uh, being showcased for a trade and well it'd be interesting if you know i mean left-handed long lanky guy very durable what what kind of value he would bring in return that would be my question what what would the dodgers get in return 400 fiducia of course you know the dodgers are so deep at the catcher spot i i wouldn't think that they would hesitate to trade one of their catchers if, if they got you know a position of need so that would be interesting from that scenario Fiducia Vivas and my man Wardo Ryan Ward. I love that young man. Old school, tough. Graduated with less than a hundred young men. One of the best prospects in all the game of baseball from a hit tool perspective, especially when you consider the balance between power and average. He is just simply fantastic. I think he's overlooked because of Andy Pajes. They've kind of come up together at the same time. And Pajes has always been that guy that's been highly ranked. Very, and I, I don't mean that against Andy. Andy's very good. Okay, another comment. Nick's an electric arm. Austin's got a chance to see him. Super impressive. Guarantee the stat cast data is unreal. I would agree with that. So, oh, Alex DeJesus, he got to see him too. He's rooting for him. DeJesus has a double with Toronto so far. Hey, um, you know, I, I pulled up some of uh, Frasso's 2022 stats. He had a one, 1.83 ERA mm-hmm. in 16 starts, had 54 innings pitched, 76 strikeouts, and a whip of .93. Talk about some numbers. <laughs> I mean, that's that's impressive. That is extremely impressive. Um, came out of Loyola. Loy, I always have a really Loyola. hard time saying this. Loyola Marymount. Yeah, yeah. Who was? They were actually here in Stillwater not too long ago, and mm-hmm. you know, fortunately for me, Cowboys put a whooping on them. But uh, yeah, man, yes. they they produce some really, really, really high talent or highly talented baseball players, and especially pitchers. Um, you know, I had I had the chance to go and and catch a game on uh, frick, I don't remember what day it was, but to see that the arms that they rolled out with, uh, 
they rolled out with several in one game just because OSU can can stroke and then there's yeah. no question about that. But every pitcher that they seem to put in was extremely, extremely good. Yeah. Tomatley says, I don't know if this is accurate, but he kind of reminds me of Mark Fidris, the Birdman. And I, I totally agree with that. And another guy in the system that I totally compare to Mark Fidrich is Cole Percival. If you just watch just kind of his mechanics and his quirky, just, you know, the way that he reacts to success and failures and all those kinds of things, it's totally fun to watch. So I love the Mark Fidrich body-wise type comparison. I, I think that's a fantastic comparison for him. I, I think that that hits home very, very well. So from a stuff perspective, Chase, you're the pitching guy. Tell us what you see here a little bit more. I see a really, really high quality curveball. Um, yeah. You know, if you see how quick that that thing breaks down and how sharp and how hard it breaks down, um, in a hitter's eyes, man, that's it's so hard to hit because it, it seems like with that velocity coming at you, it, it breaks down so fast and so mm -hmm. hard. Um, everything looks like a fastball until it gets about, I'd say, 10 to 10 to 7 feet in front of you. Um, and all of a all of a sudden, it's like somebody's just spiking a volleyball down um, with with how with how good that uh, that curveball is. Oh, guy lost a bat. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it, does but he just look at that guy hit? There's absolutely no load to it, and he's just just trying to make contact. That tells you how how this ball's getting on him fast. Yeah, it, that that's a very impressive changeup, by the way. Great changeup, um, man. I, I this this guy gets me really really excited. Yeah. Uh, he he he's climbing, man. He's climbing the ranks, man. He's getting a lot he, of pub. He has a whole lot of potential, man. And I, I hope. I actually I don't hope. I guarantee that we see him in Oklahoma City. Um, and when he pitches, you best believe I'm going to be sitting in the stands. Well, hopefully I, you're going to be interviewing him. I'm going to send you over there and I, hopefully get an that, interview out of him. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, to look yeah. up to that six six frame. Uh, that's a <laughs> giant man. Um, Brew Baker has a really interesting comparison to Molly. Got to get these guys to start talking to the baseball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Like the bird man Mark Fidris did. I love it. <laughs> I think that uh, – Hey, think... when you have the bird man Mark Fidris get brought up in your group chat, you've got some pretty damn good fans, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I think uh, – We just need to all have – like babies and like multiply by like three or four then we can have a real big chat right <laughs> yeah absolutely um he seems and and i know we're kind of getting off topic and <laughs> because we're not talking about i'm not talking about baseball when i say this but he seems like a very interesting person to have a conversation with yeah in terms yeah. of how he reacts and, and the way that he acts and things like that he would be a very fun person to talk to in my opinion Hey, Austin, I'd be curious, did you get a chance while, well, of course, this is the Loons uniform you're seeing here. Did you get a chance to see him? How many times did you? Boy, look at that change. Of, holy smoke. How many times did you get a chance to see him? Did you get a chance to sit behind him whenever he is pitching? I'd be curious to hear from Austin because I know he made it a point to sit behind Gavin Stone and several others when he had a chance to, then that fastball up in the zone. That's pretty good. So you have that change. There's the slider. So you just saw the fastball riding up in the zone. You saw the change up with a little bit of fade, more tumble. Then you saw the just the really nasty slider. So, wow. Yeah, catcher can't even <laughs> catch it. Um, yeah. <laughs> man, and, and if you look at the way how how violent and aggressive look at that. he is. And then he adds depth to it with yes. two strikes. That's what we were talking about with Pepio earlier. You know, you have the smaller slider early to throw the strike, and then he adds depth with two strikes to make it look more like a curveball. That's I love that combination. Yeah, the hitter the hitters look like they're having a really hard time. I haven't seen a guy step yet. Um, but if you look, like I was saying, if you if you look at how aggressive and how violent he is with his hips and and how he brings the backside through, um, you know, so not not only is he using his his tall lanky frame to help him out, but man, he is he is really firing the hips through, which is obviously leading to more velo. Um, and I, I'm you know I'm I'm curious to see. You know, if he if he's been able to put on any weight, um, and if he has, man, that's going to jump in at a hundred, easy. Yeah, no doubt about it. And and the effective velocity because he's so long and lanky, because he gets down the hill, you know, he's going to be releasing it a lot closer to the catcher than most guys. 
So if he does hit 99, 100, it's going to have an effective velocity that's 104, 105, 106, and that's not an exaggeration. So, okay, Austin says, saw him for one start in Lansing right behind home plate. That's what I'm talking about right there. We have the best fans of any show on earth. Right behind home plate, one of the best pitching performances of the year with Ryan as the piggyback called up immediately afterwards. So, yeah, there you go. We have the best crowd in the world sat right behind him. I will, I will say I will say this and and this is for any baseball fan if you want to see how extremely talented the, these guys are especially talking about pitchers t- spend a little bit of extra money and sit right behind home plate it's the best seat you're going to be able to get and man to see the ball move to see how yeah. hard it comes in to see how hard it breaks um not only not only is it impressive as a pitcher but when the hitters are able to make contact with that stuff that I mean, it's extremely impressive, and that gives you a, a really, really good perspective on um, on what those guys are seeing and what they're able to do with the baseball. Watch him drop there. Then he kind of comes behind his head with the baseball, so a hitter doesn't even pick up the release until it's almost out of his hand. So he hides the ball well too, which is another aspect. And Tamatly says, "I read about the plus plus fastball, but I'm seeing the nasty with his pitches." Sheesh, no doubt about it. With the jerky delivery, with the deception as far as how he delivers the ball, and then with all the nasty stuff. This guy, this guy, this guy, I mean, he, he has it, no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I don't know if you saw uh I don't know if you saw the comment too long not too long ago, but Sal uh was asking if we could give starting lineups oh, in yes. the live stream. Yeah, but one hundred percent we could give lineups. I think I think if you watch this, you know, we're not shy of Giving our opinion, <laughs> which that and about a dollar, a dollar, and we'll get you a cup of coffee, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, Valerie, you gotta just, you just gotta, you gotta, gotta get it going. You gotta travel the two hours. You need to get with Austin, and he's he, he'll get you all squared away as far as where you sit, all the amenities, and how to enjoy a Loons game. And you just need to get up there to to Midland, Michigan, and watch you a Loons game. Yeah, absolutely. Austin said he was just out of frame in a few of these shots, which is – that's awesome. That's, that is. That's great. That is. Um, if you're on the south side of Great Lakes, you can try to make it to some of the road games. I live a few hours away from Great Lakes, but have four other stadiums within two hours. Highly recommend. That Midwest League is awesome baseball. I love that high level of baseball because, you know, that, that's – those guys are still climbing and they're just still so motivated and they're just so talented. So that's a fun – fun level of baseball hey chase before we wrap this thing up we're going to hit on the other side of it and wrap up some thoughts on spring training anything else that you wanted to add about nick frasso man just a really really impressive guy and i I, like i said i hope we're able to keep him um because i know that he's going to be very sought after um and with with how many talented right handers the dodgers have i'm curious to see if we can keep him yep yep Okay, so we're back here for final thoughts, and and I know, you know, Mike just mentioned a minute ago that that he wants us to give, uh, you know, our starting lineups who we think our starting lineups would be. So, all right, let's go ahead and cut to it right now, Chase. Let's go from all nine position spots, and what what would your starting lineup be? And I'd like, as as we say them, I would like for the crowd, that the audience, to to give their starting lineups too. Yeah, absolutely, and, and that's what I was doing when I was jotting some stuff down over here on my paper because it this it was yeah. kind of hard for me to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually made a batting lineup too. So I got Mookie at one, playing oh. right. I've got Rojas at two. Oh, you got if Rojas he, at two. If he's hitting how he is right now. Well, yeah, okay. I have Rojas at two. Uh, obviously playing short. I got Freddie at three, playing first. I've got Smith at four, catching. And then I've got Hayward as the DH at five. I've got Taylor playing third at six. I've got Vargas at seven. You have playing Taylor second. playing where? Third. Over Muncie? Yep. Hot take. Hot take. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hot oh, take. Man. No doubt. <laughs> I've got I've got Trace Thompson in left batting eight, and I have James Outman playing center batting nine. And what I did see. Was Rojas and Outman are interchangeable? So you have no JD Martinez or Max Muncy in your offensive lineup. That's correct. 
<laughs> oh man, that that was fun. I'll, all I got to say is if that's the lineup they throw out there the first day of the season, Dodgers fans are going to lose their minds. <laughs> I'm not. I'm going to be pretty happy. <laughs> Who did you have at second base? Uh, I had Vargas. So you're going to have Miguel Vargas and James Altman line up, but not J.D. Martinez or Max Muncy. I don't like the way J.D. Martinez is performing right now. I really don't. And going based off last year, I, <laughs> I can see you're getting a little frustrated, which is kind of funny. <laughs> I'm not frustrated. <laughs> no, you and I have been in the war room plenty of times enough to know. Well, you know, <laughs> you know me well enough. <laughs> That's why this is funny, man. <laughs> But oh yeah, I know. I, I mean, if you've watched, the, if you've, if you watched the show before, <laughs> if you watched the show before, man, I, I just don't like Muncie. I don't, I don't like him. I don't know why. I know that that I'm probably gonna catch heat in the comments. Too I don't, I don't really care. I just think that he's too inconsistent. I really do. I mean, great player. I just, I can't get over how piss poor he was last year for for four months yeah yeah I, but it's so fr- it was and so he frustrating was coming off a pretty gruesome injury man i know it was i was just so frustrated i was so mad is there anything i can do to get you over that like can we take any medicine or <laughs> is, <laughs> is is there an elixir or something we can give you to get over that <laughs> I mean, uh, I really... the dude had an injury and he struggled for four months because he was injured and then he performed very well down the stretch. And he's been really good his entire career. And by the way, I got to see him all the way back to Keller High School and at Baylor. And I got to see him twice in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I think he went like 18 for 18 against OSU with like eight home runs. Maybe that's another reason I don't like him, all right? Just, <laughs> I mean, uh, as you said, we're not afraid to give our opinion. I gave oh, yeah. you mine. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it is what it is. It and is I'm giving is. you hell. I'm giving you hell. Oh, that's yeah. okay. That's okay. <laughs> no, that's exactly what this is for. Okay. So, what would your starting rotation be? Oh, God. Oh, man. Oh, I would go... You gonna go with the five easy ones? You gotta guess so. Kershaw. Well, no, Gonsolin's gonna be out for starting day. So who's gonna that? Well, who's gonna take that fifth spot? Center uh, no, guard. part of that. Take your fourth spot. No, it's because you're gonna have Yadiyas, Kershaw, and then you're gonna have May and center guard. So who's gonna take the fifth spot? Pepio. I would say Pepio or Grove. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really a toss-up between those two guys, in my, in my opinion. No Gavin Stone? <sighs> <laughs> Good problem to have, isn't it? Crap, man. I don't know. No Bobby Miller? No as Andre big Jackson? A fan, as, big of, as big a fan of as I am of Bobby Miller, I want to see him in OKC before he goes up to L.A. Yeah, here's Mike's. Rojas at short leading off. Mookie in right field batting second. Freeman at first base batting third. Will Smith catching fourth. Muncie at third in the five-hole. Taylor in left field in the six hole, Vargas at second base in the seven hole, Altman in center field in the nine hole. Can you imagine James Altman in the nine hole getting fastballs all day long? Okay, and then here's your situation here, and, and man, Mike, you and I are right on the same page here. The only thing that I would bring an argument up with is do you platoon Chris Taylor and Jason Hayward? You know, Jason Hayward is not in that lineup. Where is and who your DH there? Do you have, where is your DH? Do you I wonder. Have, I wonder if that's where Hayward comes in. Yeah, is Hayward your DH? Do you platoon Hayward with Chris Taylor in in left field, and then is JD Martinez your your DH? So that would be that would be that would be. I think I would go exactly like Mike has. I think I think I would make a rotation between a platoon with Taylor. And yes, Mike says yes. I think the I think Mike's on it. I think you platoon Hayward and Taylor and left, and then Hayward also DHs some. You can platoon a little bit based off of matchups with Martinez as far as that goes. Now, if JD Martinez starts hitting, that's all over. I think that's it right there. I, I like that. Yeah, and I I know Martinez has not been impressive so far, so it's going to be up to him. But I will say this: they signed him 
for what ten million dollars, and he's going to have to be unimpressive till about July, till they decide not to play him. Would you agree? So with I, have that? A qu- I have a question for you. Yeah. In my lineup, would it change your mind at all if I put Vargas at third? If I put Vargas at third and Chris Taylor at second, no. Would that make any difference? No, that would make it worse for me. You think so? Of, of all positions on the field that I would put Chris Taylor second base would be the last one. Okay. I mean, that's fair. That's He's all, too that's... athletic. He's too athletic, and he's too streaky offensively. He needs to eat up one of the really vital defensive positions to have value. And he needs to eat up, like, the three or four most valuable defensive positions. So when he's, like, 0 for 10 and strikes out six times, he's still providing value for the team. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. If – if Muncie does what he did last year, and I know he came off an injury, but if Muncie does what he did last year, early, yes, yeah, Chris Taylor could go to third base. I don't have a problem with that. I th- I think that I, I think that's what you'll see. I mean, I don't I don't know what else you would. Or, see. I see where you're going. Vargas could go to third base, yeah, and, and Taylor or Bush could go to second. I see what you're saying there, right? But and, but well, Chase, I'm just thing. telling you, I I understand what you're saying, and I. And I'm a high school coach, too, and I think that's the high school coach and us coming out because we have 36 games and we have to make adjustments. You know, hey, we have like five or six games to make adjustments. You know what I'm saying? Okay, the Dodgers aren't going to do that for a long, long, long time. They're going to give runway to Muncie. Well, look what they did last year. They gave him four months and it paid off for him, right? Right. Muncie's not coming out of lineup. J.D. Martinez is going to have to suck forever to not be in the lineup. Right. Jason and I, Hayward is going to get every chance to be an everyday starter on this team. Yeah, and that's this is not my guess as to what it's going to be opening day. That that would be my lineup opening yeah. day. There's right. a, there's a, obviously there's a difference. If I, if I was making one that I thought was going to come out on opening day, Muncie would obviously be in it yeah. without a doubt. Um, would you automatically have Miguel Vargas at second, having not even swung a bat yet, or would you have Taylor at second? I think right now you'd have to put Chris Taylor because Vargas hadn't swung a bat yet. I, mean, I, I don't agree. think I don't think you have any choice. But I'm I'm also in, in and I know this is this won't happen. I know it won't happen. But I'm also not against putting Michael Bush at second base. No, me neither. <laughs> you know not I'm not. I mean, yeah. not not one bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Valerie says have to platoon Taylor because at the moment he's the utility infielder, and I will take Valerie one step further than that. I think he's also utility outfielder as well. I think he can play center field, left field. Second base, shortstop, third base, you name it. Tamale says 100% case that we know how the Dodgers operate, whether agree or not. And, boy, it's a tough one for me because I'm a prospect guy and I get to see these guys and I love these guys. And there's no human being on earth that has more faith in these guys than I do. So when you ask me, I always want to play the prospect, always. Because, I, and same with you, Chase. Are you still, I can't tell, yeah, okay. So, you know, so for me, sometimes it gets frustrating for me the way the Dodgers stick with their veterans, but I, I, I've got to admit, you know, hey, that works. It works. I can't, you know, and, and we haven't even mentioned David Peralta yet, right? Right, <laughs> right. So, I mean, what you know. Yeah, no, I I knew I was going to catch some heat when I took Muncie out. I knew yeah. it. I knew it for, for a fact. Um but I was okay with it. You know, I thought it would be a little bit of fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, uh, no. I'm on the same page with Brew Baker here. It's hard to draw conclusions from a small sample size with JD. He has a long track record of success. Saw that in Detroit. Very confident he'll replicate near that with larger sample size. Okay. I'm on that page, and I know the Dodgers are going to be on that page, and that's the sample size they're going to give him. Yeah. And should. No, I mean, and should. I mean, I don't see why they shouldn't. Right. I mean, he has had a track record of success. There, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, I, I was going based off of what I've seen in the last few days of spring training. Yeah, you're I mean, getting ganged up on right here, bro, by the way. That, hey, that's okay. <laughs> We're that's all okay. firing bullets at you right now. <laughs> that's Hey, and I'm dodging them left and right. All right, you got to shoot better. You're you taking them like a better. man. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I, I knew I knew when I said my lineup I was gonna catch it, and that's that's perfectly okay. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll fun. take it. Yeah. Um, man, that was fun. That was a lot it of was. fun. 
Hey, any more <laughs> final thoughts from the audience? I think we're about time to get out of here. I'm getting old and, and tired, and I got a pit bull that's getting cranky on me. Heard on, I think it was a Fangrass podcast, Dodgers' long-term plans are still Vargas at third. Yeah, I would have to think that would be. Maybe when they're ready to move Betts to second base full-time. Yeah, that you know, Mookie Betts had came out and said that he wants to move back to second base at some point. So I wouldn't – I think that's probably where they're getting – that information from was Betts came out today and said, hey, whatever the team needs me to do, I'm going to play right field if I have to. But my home is second base. That's where I feel comfortable. I hope someday I can move back there. Which would change my lineup completely. Yeah, but, no, doubt, no doubt. I mean, <laughs> that is All right, let's go over is. Valerie's lineup. Okay, if I had my way, Betts leading off. You have Freeman two-hole, Smith three-hole, Martinez four-hole, Vargas five. Vargas five-hole. Wow, okay. third base. Rojas, six. Bush, seven. Wow, I like Josh. And Altman, eight. How about that, man? You've got three rookies out of four positions in the offensive lineup, and I love that confidence. Hayward, nine. Peralta, platoon. How about that? And sh- she doesn't have Muncie, baby. Let's oh, go. Oh, 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 look at you. We're Let's ending the go. show on that one, man. I can't. Let's. <laughs> okay, hey, thanks for all the thoughts in the crowd. In the audience, this is a wonderful show. Chase, do you have any final comments? I don't, man. That was a, that was a lot of fun, and I it was. I appreciate the constructive criticism from the crowd. <laughs> hey, fans! Just a reminder: go on over to www.dodgersdaily.net for more information on all the Dodgers prospects and more. I do write some some daily articles on the LA Dodgers as well. More of kind of my that's where I kind of do more of my blog work. I do more of my reporting work on the prospects but again that's www.dodgersdaily.net hey help spread the word about dodgers dogs we're going to do this every single week at at uh, eight o'clock well it's eight o'clock our time six o'clock pacific each wednesday night we're going to do this dodgers dog show this was the first episode of season two so please spread the word so chase and i can continue to bring you shows like this in the future and go ahead and go on over to the dodgers daily youtube page and make, make sure you're a subscriber. Tell all your friends about Dodgers Daily and hit that notification button and turn on those notifications so every time that we set up a live show or we set up a premiere or we just release a video that you will get notified and tell all your friends to turn on those notifications because if Dodgers Daily grows, uh, then we can keep providing you content like this in the future. We can keep having wonderful conversations like we had tonight uh with these shows so hey with that i think we're going to get out of here we would like to thank everybody in the crowd for tuning in to dodgers daily and dodgers dogs tonight and give a big go dodgers